Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Liberté. I'm a part of Infrastructure Product Partnerships team at Facebook. Somebody said to me yesterday that I don't look like an engineer, so I brought my hoodie today to look a little bit more fitting to the image. Uh, last year, we set out on a fairly ambitious goal to help drive OCP adoption and help enable the software ecosystem around open hardware. Early last spring, we opened uh, a hardware lab at Facebook campus. It's called the Segregate Lab. We filled it up with OCP gear and uh, invited our first two partners, Canonical and Red Hat, to validate and test their software packages on open compute. We worked with packages such as OpenStack, operating systems, obviously, provisioning tools, orchestration tools, and we shared this knowledge with the community at an OCP workshop that we held um, last summer. Um, however, we felt that while compute has been heavily disaggregated over the last years and maybe decades, network gear and storage was lagging in disaggregation. So my colleague and counterpart did an amazing job helping enable the software ecosystem around networking gear with partners like Microsoft Sonic System, um, Cumulus, SnapRoute, Abstra, and others. And he presented his findings and their findings at an event that we held at uh, Facebook campus a couple of months ago, the disaggregate event. In parallel, we were inviting software-defined storage partners to join us at the lab to test and validate their software-defined storage packages on open compute storage hardware. So today you're going to hear from four of those partners, Network Appliance, NetApp, IBM, Hedvig, and Weka, and they will share the story how they tested their software on, um, uh, on open compute storage hardware, uh, how the setup works, how long it took them, and so forth. Every, uh, each presenter will have about 10 minutes to share their story and a couple of minutes for questions. What I hope you leave with today after this workshop is the sense that today you can build a resilient and reliable storage infrastructure on open hardware and using your choice of open source or commercial software-defined storage package from very mature software operating systems to newer ones and everything in between. So with that, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Network Appliance. Uh, so NetApp may be perceived by many of you as a very hardware-centric storage company. However, they joined the OCP community as a platinum member last year. They joined us first at the lab. They did a lot of work. They kept iterating. And today, you, you'll see how you can use a very feature-rich, mature, and flexible storage operating systems system on open compute hardware. Without further ado, thank you, Robert, James. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, thank you. Uh, first off, I, I want to you know, put a special thanks out to, to Michael, to Will, and, and Iran, and, and all the people that helped make the Disaggregate Lab uh, possible and, and make that available to us. I think that's a, a huge opportunity for a lot of us to be able to go through certification and validation process for our products. And so I, I can't thank you guys enough for, for doing that. So thank you. Uh, so I can go back one slide. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I think that you know, the, the one thing I want to kind of address is maybe the elephant in the room. And I think a lot of people, they see NetApp uh, and they wonder, you know, why is a, an engineered platform uh, storage company actually participating in OCP? Uh, and, and so I really want to kind of take a step back to where we started as a company. So 25 years ago, when we were actually started here, uh, Dave Hitz, one of our founders, you know, really said that NetApp is a software company. But, you know, due to some of the challenges and gaps that we saw from a hardware standpoint and some of the reliability and, and scalability and what the data center needs were, we had to basically create our own engineered systems to support what those needs were of the data center. And so, you know, with that, we came out with our systems that, that you see today and probably are most familiar with. Now, as we move forward and we've seen the acceleration and innovation that's been happening in the hardware community, those platforms have really exceeded what sometimes you can do from an engineering standpoint. And so we've kind of come full circle back to actually where we started as a company, back to what we, we see as a software-defined world. And, and through this journey, we've actually made several iterations through our products 
to allow us to do software-defined solutions. So initially being able to virtualize multiple storage systems on a single platform was what we were doing about 10 to 15 years ago. And then as we stepped forward, as we started to see software-defined starting to make emergence in the edge and the perimeter of networks, we had what we called an on-tap edge, which was more of an edge type of appliance. And then now as we've seen software-defined and, and open hardware move into the primary and at the core of the data center, again, we're pivoting as well to basically accommodate uh, data management solutions within the data center, and that's moving to what we call uh, ONTAP Select. And one other part to this, and, and I wanted to call this out, is ONTAP Select is the first thing that we have actually done validation and testing within the uh, disaggregation lab. Uh, and we've been doing that at a few other labs across the country uh, for supportability and validation of ONTAP Select. That being said, as a company, all of our software offerings that we provide today, um, we, we basically are, have a charter as of seven years ago that we deliver them in three major flavors. One being engineered, which I think is most people are familiar with traditionally as NetApp. The second being something that would actually run into the cloud. And then the third being a true software-defined solution for that. So ONTAP Select is what we tested initially. Our next steps within the, the lab that we're actually going to be testing going forward is our object store solution within Storage Grid, our, our AltaVault solution, which is the ability to uh, replicate data out to the cloud, and then uh, our Element X, which is our solid fire operating system, as well to bring that into uh, an open compute uh, environment. So that's kind of what we're seeing as our, our roadmap and, and our view of where we're going to go from where we are today and where we are going tomorrow. Uh, so next slide. Thanks. Uh, so what is ONTAP Select? So ONTAP Select is basically taking our ONTAP operating system and removing the uh, engineered system on the background and putting that on a commodity storage environment or, or server environment, sorry. Uh, so it sits on a hypervisor uh, and then basically addresses disks that are presented to uh, each of those uh, virtual en entities uh, within ONTAP. So it is still the same enterprise class data management solution and feature set that we provide on our, our storage arrays, but actually port it into uh, uh, open uh, compute and open uh, software plat or open storage platform uh, within the data center. Uh, so Basically, this, this journey we've been on is the ability to decouple our software away from the hardware and then present that as just a software-only solution. Uh, so today, as it stands, uh, we're able to do uh, 400 terabytes within uh, HA cluster, uh, so four nodes. Uh, pretty fast failover, uh, and we're continuing to make advancements there to uh, add additional uh, hypervisor support as well um, as we continue to add more functionality to the, the product here. So, Everything that you would expect from NetApp from a data management standpoint is all included in this from our replication technology, uh, from our ability to do uh, cloning and snapshots and, and a lot of those feature sets are all in there and, and, and when we turn this over to James, he'll kind of talk about what we were doing in the labs as well around that feature set testing. Okay? Uh, the, the one interesting thing to note here is as part of you know, our engineering efforts on all of our, our uh, software offerings and hardware offerings, Everything talks to each other. And so what I mean by that is ONTAP Select footprint can be an enabler as you start to move from more of an engineering traditional data center into more of a software-defined data center. Those systems can actually replicate data between them. They understand they run the same operating system, the same management uh, interface that controls all of those. It's, it's a uniform view uh, for uh, our storage, our storage architects and administrators. So it gives us an easy way to step into you know, a software-defined solution from our traditional data center as this, as this evolution is occurring. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the, the brains of the operation uh, that, that did a lot of our testing and validation within the lab. Uh, so I'll introduce James Lau. Hi. So we uh, deployed it across a 4 node cluster, and um, they're basically sitting on uh, four um, Leopard servers. And each of the servers are connected to a tray of uh, disks uh, on the Knox JBot. Uh, we also have to leverage a uh, RAID controller uh, to, uh, add on to the server. And all the servers have dual uh, 10 gig uh, connectivity. And we you know, basically install this on top of VM where it runs as a VM with local disks attached to each of the nodes. And uh, in terms of function, we tested uh, all the, most of the functionality from our uh, select offering. Uh, we did NFS, SIFS, 
uh, you know, created a snapshot, snap mirrors, and, uh, you know, VEX log, almost all the features you get from our standard engineering platforms. That's it. Is there any questions? As a bare metal, no, uh, no, not currently not. And, and, the other one is, and, and actually, let me add to that a little bit. So, you know, one of the challenges that that you know we as a data management company move into a software-defined world is there's still this interesting balance between how do you guarantee data integrity, as well as you know basically open up or, or unleash the shackles to allow any type of hardware underneath there. So there are some pieces that we still have to do from a hardware abstraction layer to make sure that we're able to you know, meet some of those changes. As, as in, you know, then you start to get into firmware versions and other things potentially causing havoc and, and ultimately you know, data has gravity, so we have to treat it a lot different than something that's transient like you know, a, a packet or a compute, right? And then you put it on KVM? Uh, in progress. Okay. So uh, we, will, we will see KVM support very soon. I'm sorry? 400 terabytes, is that the limit for yeah. a virtual cluster? Correct, today it's 100 terabytes per node, so 400 terabytes uh, for a four node cluster, exactly, yeah. What do you think? Does Onshaft require a compatible No, so that was one of the things that we, yeah, so uh, the question was, uh, doesn't ONTAP require an NVRAM card, right? Um, so yes, in the, in the engineering systems, we do use an NVRAM uh, card to you know, basically guarantee the right and then, and then send back the acknowledgement. Uh, in the, the software defined in select, uh, we're not using NVRAM card because, and we're also not using traditional RAID, so there's multiple rights that are occurring on the background. So we actually commit the right, uh, we commit the acknowledgement as the rights occur. Correct, when you compare it to, you know, one of the high-end NVRAM systems, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. We, we do have a RAID controller uh, used on the system, so we deploy um, uh, a RAID group uh, from the RAID controller, and then the software sits on top of that. Yes. I don't have the ETA system. I, well, I don't, I'm not sure yet, yeah. Can we repeat the question? Yes. Oh, yeah, you want to know uh, uh, what's the roadmap on uh, increasing the number of nodes? Yeah, so uh, obviously that would be an NDA discussion, but we can have those discussions. Um, so there are plans for several different things, but yeah, obviously an NDA roadmap discussion outside of, of this community here, so. Can we use the NDA flavor Correct, yeah. Yeah, the, the two flavors are uh, one and four, yeah. I think. Yeah. You can have multiple SAS controllers, you can have multiple NICs, you can have NICs with different bandwidths. It's, uh, at the end of the day, it's, uh, uh, it's flexible. It really depends on the hardware that you use. The beauty of open compute, yes? Yep. Well said. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll keep it. Okay, um, I guess one more question. One more? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so absolutely, uh, it's in, in use in, in quite a few places. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the the question to to is it only enabled on the OCP uh, in the OCP community? Uh, no, it's actually on on all the commoditized hardware. Um, but there is some uh, so interoperability matrix that we have in place today, and so that was one of the efforts that that we've been focused on from an OCP community perspective is to get validation for what's available. Uh, from a hardware perspective to be able to run uh, select on those hardware platforms. So that's been the focus that we've been putting on and you know, the, the work that James has been doing in the lab to get that validation and, and interoperability matrix additions to be, be made.
Cool. So uh, thank you, NetApp. Appreciate, appreciate your work. Um, next up, I want to introduce Christopher, Christopher Maestes. He is with IBM, a spectrum scale, what used to be called GPFS, arguably uh, one of the most mature, flexible, and feature-rich distributed parallel file systems on the market today. Um, it deploy I, Christopher, you'll probably sell it better than I can. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so yeah, my name is uh, Chris Maestas. Um, I'm with IBM and I'm a global architect within the system storage division. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, got a, I got a call around December timeframe, you know, from, uh, from internal IBM. Hey, would you be interested in running Spectrum Scale at, at Facebook on an OCP platform? I was like, hell yeah, let's go do, let's go do it, right? So in January, we sort of said, you know, sort of set ourselves up to come and sort of uh, do that. Who here has heard of GPFS in the past? GPFS is rebranded as Spectrum Scale, right? So that's essentially what we're, what we're installing here. Next slide. So essentially, we've come a long way for a 20-year-old file system that we've had you know, in, in technology, right? We started out in high-performance computing, being able to go very, very fast, right? You know, we've, if you've heard us in Department of Energy, right now for the Coral project, we have to meet over two terabytes a second you know, of a, a performance, right? So we're, we're very good at performance. When it comes to tiering to various kind of storage technologies, right, whether it's flash, whether it's disk, tape, a shared nothing cluster, um, we have a, a spectrum scale RAID, which is a software defined RAID solution that we have as well, that sort of takes a bunch of disks and, and runs that into configuration. And what's really cool is we can move data seamlessly amongst all these kinds of environments, right? Um, so when this whole terminology of software-defined storage came out, you know, it, me, me and a couple of our guys we were sort of scratching our heads, software-defined storage, well, that's, that's what we are, right? I mean, that, that's what GPFS has been in the past. And so not only have we kind of grown in what kind of storage you can have, if it's a block device, we can put a file system on it, right? So we're very good about that. But at the interface level, right, it's not just the native shared disk protocol you can use, which is the, the GPFS protocol or the spectrum scale protocol you can access. You can access, you know, you know it's a POSIX-based environment where you can use NFS, you can use SMB. Um, you know, it's an analytics-based environment where you can talk HDFS, you know, and run Spark workloads on there as well. It's a block environment, you know, both from an OpenStack community standard uh, where IBM has contributed a lot of code to the OpenStack. So all of the, the various Manila, Glance, Cinder, Swift are, are part of this environment and talking to the, the technology. And iSCSI, you know, we just introduced iSCSI doing MM block to sort of create blocks and, you know, to present that. And from an object standpoint, what we did is we took our work that we did in OpenStack, Swift, and we added, you know, the, the S3 emulation layer on that. And lo and behold, now we have, you know, object interface to that. So you can tier amongst all these, you know, kinds of uh, storage devices, but you can present at all these kinds of layers. And what that does is allows us to, you know, whatever application you want to run, we, there's a 99% chance that it's going to run and, and you're going to get, gain performance and, and improvement in there. You know, we, we have things like encryption, compression uh, that's, that's in the file system, tiering to various kinds of uh, locations with, uh, you know, active file management, which is what our, uh, was shown here. And then, you know, we have a new technology where we're transparent, transparently tiering to cloud environments. So IBM did an acquisition of CleverSafe, which we sort of integrated that into our environment. So we're, we're, we're growing. This, this technology has not become stale, right? I mean, in the 20 years that we've had. When HDFS came out, you know, Hadoop was the big word. No problem, we can handle it. When Objects is out, no problem, we can handle it. So uh, if we go to the next slide, we can sort of see the environment that we ran in here on the, uh, in the Facebook um, lab was we had four OCP ser uh, servers, right? They were Intel-based kind of servers and two NOC storage arrays. So we came in and, and spent a couple days here and 99% of your work is in the preparation, right? If you have a defined operating system, you have the you know, host file, you have the time set up, right? It's, it's gonna be easy to deploy. So, you know, we, we got all that set up, and before we left, right, we had Spectrum Scale, GPFS, running in this, this kind of environment. Um, if we go to the next slide, actually, uh, well, maybe this is, sorry, this is the, the, other, the other presentation. Uh, just go back another slide. 
So we actually, this past Tuesday, had our, um, we had some uh, two open power barrel eye systems shipped to this lab, and we put spectrum scale on that. So we put two uh, uh, open power servers connected to a single NOx array, and we had that running on there uh, without any kind of issue as well. So we've been able, to, been able to demonstrate that we could put, you know, spectrum scale on the standard OCC, OCP kind of platforms that you have today with, with NOx storage arrays, and new generation OCP platforms like based on open power and still you know get the same kind of uh, improvement over that. Uh, next slide. So you know it took you know 30 minutes to install end to end right and you know it wasn't us you know coming in and, and uh, driving for Facebook right. Facebook was on the driver's seat and they were running the deployment you know methods and running the commands and we wrote a, a, a white paper that sort of showed the, the steps to do that. Um, it's, it's, uh, uh, our technology, you know, is now based on a chef-based install toolkit, right? So you can see the cookbooks that we're providing and actually deploy that in your well. And for the old school people out here, right, I mean, we still do standard-based, RPM-based, or Debian-based kind of installs as well, so that we don't take nothing away from what we've done in the past as we add new improvements to the technology. Um, so we did an install GUI, you know, to actually show how easy it is to install. Um, and then we, we showed with the, the, using the Chef cookbooks, we finished the deployment onto the storage devices and got that going. We needed to do zero changes to Spectrum Scale to run in this environment, you know, so it was just taking what we had as the, the, the latest uh, fix of Spectrum Scale, downloading that and installing it for Intel and for uh, Power Linux Little Indian is what we, we ran on the open power platform. <clears throat> the, Functional and performance testing we did, we had 10 gigabit ethernet, so we were pr pretty uh, quickly able to show that we could do a gigabyte a second on that fabric, so we sort of need to talk about next steps, you know, what, what other kind of testing can we do here, so we showed that the, the system was up, we can test, you know, we can definitely fill up your bandwidth, uh, and, you know, we showed the monitoring framework, which is based on a, an open source technology called Zymon. Um, you can export to Grafana and, you know, sort of do things like that. So we have a really extensive uh, spectrum scale GUI actually now, you know, with a, with a 20 year old technology, we, we came out with a GUI in the last two years, right? So we're, we're actually, you know, we're growing up, I sort of say. Um, we have a REST API that's released right now and being updated in our, in our next version. Uh, and, you know, we, we want to test more storage options on other OCP hardware configurations, right? Um, as I mentioned, the open power testing has been done with Spectrum Scale already, so we can, we can check that box off already. Uh, next slide. Um, the other thing I, I just, you know, shameless plug is there actually is a Spectrum Scale user group that we have uh, taking place in, uh, in Berkeley uh, next month, so you guys are all invited to, to, to check it out. We have user presentations from the past. We have a mailing list that's going on here. So it's a, it's a community that we've been sort of evolving over the past three or four years and get more uh, openness in, outside of the standard HPC kind of environments. So now we're, we're sort of showing what other people are doing with that. Um, next slide. And this, this is just a bit about, you know, the open power kind of environment that we tested on. It was, you know, firmware from IBM. It was um, really trying to show that we can engage in various kind of communities you know, that, that are being, you know, in the OCP kind of community. And if we go to the, the last slide, you know, these are, these are some of the partners that we've had that are, you know, producing open power systems today, right? Mark III, uh, Penguin Computing, Stack Velocity, right? So that are out there. But, um, you know, we, we verified that we could put spectrum scale on an OCP platform, regardless of the CPU architecture. That was our, our uh, what we did in this lab. With that, any questions? It, it's really, you know, we, we, like I said, we only had a 10 gig network, so how we, we were like, next steps we could do is come in and maybe create an InfiniBand based network. Um, actually, uh, Acceler, was, which was one of the partners as well, we've been talking with them to use their um, RDMA uh, block technology and put scale on top of that, and basically we can, we can run on RDMA fabrics as well and sort of see how the two interoperate. So the key things to take away, you know, spectrum scale, GPFS, it, it's uh, 
software-defined solution. It's not, you know, uh, challenging to install at all. It was, it was really easy to get going in this environment and to qualify on OCP platforms, it, it's, uh, it works. That's the thing to take away. Yes. Scaling and, and capacity, right? So we, we, um, we've done 30 petabyte systems with, without any kind of challenge, right? Uh, our Argonne National Labs has, you know, solution of uh, basically each rack has about a one petabyte usable and they have 30 of those that are, that are sort of intertwined with uh, IBM and DDN storage. Uh, from, uh, you know, the number of clients to connect, right? It's pretty much unlimited. I mean, a, a single kind of cluster can handle 16,000 uh, nodes, right, in, in the environment. But with technology to do uh, connectivity with active file management and I can sort of sync data between remote locations, I'm really unlimited in, in where I can go with the data. Yes. Funny you should bring that up. So I, <laughs> IBM is, is working in, in the lab, in, you know, in, in that kind of angle and those steps. You know, what we can do today with spectrum scale without a RAID controller, right, is a RAID 0 or a RAID 1 or, you know, a three-way replication, right? That's no problem from the, just the software managing the JBODs. Um, you know, to RAID controllers, uh, hardware-based RAID controllers, yes, we use it. They present to us. We work with that all the time. Exporting our technology, our software-defined RAID controller, which we call spectrum scale RAID, uh, outside of what we've done in our basic configurations, we're, we're bringing that technology to new kinds of environments. To be honest with you, the challenge that we've had is not all uh, SAS buses are equal, not all you know, disp you know, buses are equal, and we really have been working um, you know, over the past two years to kind of qualify you know, a quick checklist of you know, if there's a new JBOD that wants to be qualified, what can we run through and sort of say there's a good chance that we could put a software defined, our software defined rate solution on there. Yes. Other questions? Well, like I said, take a look at the group. Thank you for your time today. So um, before I introduce our next speaker uh, about declustered RAID and in general software RAID. So Facebook publicly announced and we share this information. We run Gluster in three copies. Everybody pretty much runs HDFS in three copies. While it's not very, I guess, uh, cost effective still, you're saving so much money by running on commodity hardware. Erasure coding is being introduced into many storage uh, systems. We had conversations with IBM, with NetApp. Our next presenters will talk about their declustered raids, or I don't know if the right way to call it. So I want to present you uh, Matt. He's from Hedvig. As a matter of fact, we got introduced to Hedvig, uh, Hed Hedvig. Hedvig. Hedvig uh, yeah. by a potential adopter who was validating, evaluating their um, software on open compute, and we kind of got involved to help. So Matt, take it away. Thank All you. All right, thank you, Michael. Thanks. And, and uh, just want to echo the thanks to Facebook, to Michael, to, to Will. I was glad that Will's uh, picture, is Will in the room? So anyway, Will, Will manages the lab, the disaggregate lab at Facebook, and was very helpful. Uh, as well as Michael, so we appreciate their sponsorship. Um, we can go to the next slide. So, so Hedvig is software-defined storage, and you know at NetApp and and at IBM, uh, those companies have have created and and been part of a lot of spin-off companies. Their employees have gone on to do many great things. Facebook is now getting to that stage where where the same can be said there. So. So our founder, uh, Avinash Lakshman, was one of a handful of people at Amazon that, that developed the Dynamo technology behind the shopping cart to provide persistence and scale uh, as, as Amazon started to grow. Uh, and then he went to Facebook and, and developed Cassandra. And, and the initial use case was for Facebook messaging and keeping track and being able to, for users to search messages. Again, as that 
platform grew from millions to hundreds of millions to where now they say, where are we going to get our next billion users, right? I mean, that's the Facebook mantra. And so Avinash took that knowledge and, uh, and founded Facebook. I'm sorry, founded, that would have been something. Founded Hedvig as uh, uh, software-defined storage. Um, and, and so what does software-defined storage mean? And, and to me, it, it, should be, it should be ultimately flexibility. The ability to, in software to find anything to meet a lot of needs. And so for, for Hedvig, we'd say we're, we're multi-tier, so we can, we can address and work with a number of uh, uh, workloads. Um, or I'm sorry, a number of tiers of workloads across a number of, of platforms and implementations. So whether it's block or file or object, uh, whether you're running on, on you know, a hypervisor, containers, uh, bare metal of some sort, and whatever your orchestration layer, OpenStack, you know, Kubernetes, Mesos, those sorts of things, Docker Swarm, whatever it is, we underpin that, that technology. We're able to, to harness that, uh, that flexibility because we're, we're built ground up as software defined. So, so again, some of the, the more mature platforms that, that have done uh, very great and powerful things in the storage industry for reasons tied to specific hardware platforms maybe uh, you know, are working now on becoming more adaptable and, and so we've started at Adaptable. Uh, and, and also, by the way, running across multiple clouds, whether it's private or private clouds and or public clouds. And our, our product is inherently site aware so that, that we can be aware of where every component is uh, in our, our, our storage platform, wh whether it's in a private data center or one cloud or the other and interact between the two. So uh, getting down a little bit to specifics, we have a two-tier architecture, and the one that's of most uh, interest in an open compute setting is our, our storage nodes. So we would take uh, commodity servers um, that have some combination of components. Uh, something that's very interesting to us is the ultimate source or, or, or destination for the persistent storage. Uh, and then also some faster storage that we can use to accelerate performance. And in this example, we're showing uh, hard drives and SSDs that, that could be NVMe. We're, we're working with different alliance partners on different sorts of storage components at, at the various levels. So we take those, we, we put our software on top of those servers, and those create uh, individually storage nodes and collectively a distributed storage platform. So, so we're able to cluster all these nodes, again, regardless but aware of uh, location, into one platform, one giant storage pool. And, and on the commodity server part, I'd say, you know, what we say at Hedvig is um, we're hardware agnostic, but the hardware matters. Obviously, if you have more, more car cores, sorry, if you have, you know, NVMe instead of spinning drives, uh, you know, more memory. Those things are going to impact your performance. But we, we strive to work across uh, multiple platforms. And certainly the one that's growing the most when we look at our pipeline, and as Michael mentioned, getting ready to do our uh, first install with the customer in OCP. But OCP is, is that architecture that's showing the most interest from uh, from customers, I'm, I'm meeting some here yesterday, today as well, that are all very much on board with OCP and we wanna be there. And I guess last point, uh, just because it's come up a couple times, I think, we, we do not use internal uh, RAID, right? We, we want to see every, every drive every which way. Okay, or every drive individually. So, so, in fact, our total architecture is in two tiers. So there are these storage nodes, and again, we would have put the software, and in this example, we're showing nine nodes, three in each of two data centers, and three more in a public cloud of your choice. Uh, and then there are host environments, and at those host environments, 
we install our, our, the second component, which is a proxy. And the proxy's main job is to translate between the Hedvig distributed messaging protocols, the things we need to do to keep track of the cluster, to get the information in the right places, and it translates between those and then industry standard protocols, iSCSI, NFS, you know, uh, S3, SWIFT. So, so then the individual hosts, as long as they talk those protocols, can talk to our storage. There's no changes in the, the, host, uh, in the host required. We also do some things uh, with uh, uh, caching and, and access to flash at the proxies to accelerate uh, IOs. So in, in many cases, then, we don't even traverse that, that network, which, uh, you know, is most typically for us a 10 gigabit Ethernet network. And you see some of the benefits that we get out of this. We, we can scale. We don't have a practical limit today to the number of nodes required. As, as, as additional storage is required, you add nodes. As additional hosts are added, you add proxies. And those scale independently, up or down. One of the cool things about software-defined storage, if you were to scale down, you now have a general purpose compute node that you could use for, for any number of other uh, activities. So, so that's our world in general. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see that what we tested was something very similar. And I tried to orient the, the, the graphic to uh, that same verticality, and, and just, you can't read it. But anyway, there, if you go to our blog, there's a better, it's a horizontal picture, and it's much more readable. But we basically installed some proxies in an ESX server uh, that was a Leopard server. And then we created three storage nodes with three Leopards connected to two NOCs. So we split the, the drives, right? Uh, and we installed um, that environment using our, our standard installation process, which is, which is Ansible based. Okay? And, and the results were things worked, right? So, so again, software defined, hardware agnostic, uh, you know, everything worked as expected. The, the functionality, the, the different interfaces, the, the GUI, the, the CLI, the RESTful API, all those things worked as expected. The performance was what we, were, we expected. We, we haven't really done performance runs in OCP yet because, uh, again, we'd want caching up at the ESX server and, and some certain numbers of, of drives and nodes, and, and we took what was generously made available to us. So, so that would be, you know, a, a future step. And we, we were able to pull drives and shut down nodes, and everything worked as expected, high resilience. Uh, the one thing we did see that, uh, you know, we thought might be interesting to you is device names, at least with the Knox device, don't appear the same using, uh, you know, the, the LSHW command the, that's a utility that's, that's very common in the Linux world. They appear a little differently. And so, uh, these had uh, mega RAID controllers. Again, we don't use them in a RAID, we use them pass through, but, but we wound up using the mega CLI to get at the device names. And that was the one thing that, that we had to change because, you know, when a drive failed, figuring out uh, that we, you know, which drive to blink so someone could service it. And then also uh, when a new one came in, recognizing where that new one was to, to have it you know, rejoin the cluster was, was a little bit of work we had to do. So for anybody that's out there implementing, that's something to consider. It's, it's not a big deal, but it was a finding that we wanted to uh, share with the community. Okay, next slide. And so, so that's it, really. Uh, we, you know, we'd be happy to talk with you, whether it's after this or some other time. My, uh, my contact information is, uh, is here. If you go to the hedviginc.com blog, uh, hedvig.com is, uh, is owned by a chamber choir in Sweden. So if you go to hedviginc.com, you know, you can find this information as well. What, what questions do you have? Stump the band. Yes, sir. How would I say that our software is different from things like Ceph or Gluster? So, um, those are uh, certainly, you know, th those are established and evolving technologies. We have certain um, feature functionality difference. For instance, we we have a global deduplication, so you know that same notion that the cluster can spread you know, across sites or in 
some customers' case across countries, we can, we can globally uh, dedupe, and that provides a level of uh, uh, assurance. And then we're, we're able to scale, and those other technologies certainly can as well, but in a more of a, I guess, a supported, you know, we, we provide a more supported fashion. And sometimes for some customers, depending on their capabilities, they're, they're looking for more help with that. So those are a couple high level differences. Other, uh, other questions? All right, thanks. Thank you, Matt. Cool. Okay, so our last presenter, um, he is with Weka, and I'm actually surprised. If you listen, so this is a new company, very, very secretive about their technology. And uh, if you listen to them, it's just too good to be true. It's screaming fast file system, distributed, everything you may want uh, from a file system. So, Shimon, take it away. Hi. So, uh, my name is Shimon Ben David, Director of Customer Engineering from Weka.io. Um, we actually came to the OCP certification game a bit late. We had like uh, two or three days uh, to accomplish it. And um, actually, I'm. I, I think I will be the one that I really want to share the numbers that uh, we got. I think you're very thirsty for that. So just a bit about Weka. We're headquartered in San Jose. Our engineering is in Israel and in uh, over here. Uh, the team is very experienced. We came from uh, IBM, from XAV, which was acquired by IBM, from EMC, from Panasa. So very firm uh, storage development backgrounds. Uh, we're VC funded, so basically we have enough money to do it right. Um, product is in full production. It's in GA. It's currently installed at some uh, EDA customers, and many customers are testing it. And uh, c um, cloud infrastructure DevOps, which we'll talk about that offering in a bit. Uh, so uh, what do we do? We're hardware independent uh, storage, and of course, when you say hardware independent, you don't mean that uh, we run on uh, thin air, right? We have some hardware requirement, but they're very broad. Uh, basically, it's designed for all flash uh, from the grounds up, so we get to benefit from uh, being designed from day one to flash. Flash could be SATA, SAS, NVMe. Uh, we'll talk about it in a bit. This, we're providing a distributed parallel file system because eventually we believe you want to, cons to consume a file system and you want to consume a high performance file system. Uh, we're fully POSIX compliant. Uh, we're running a lot of benchmarks around that. Uh, we provide N plus four data protection. Uh, doesn't mean that we can fail only four drives. It means that we can fail four failure domains, which is uh, much more when you think about it. We provide snapshots and cloud tiering, uh, which I'll show in a bit. So, um, eventually, when you think about it, uh, you have your compute servers, right? And they need to consume your uh, storage, whatever storage you provide to them. So, what we went ahead and did is we, um, we're saying, and uh, it's not a presentation, so I'll go one by one. So, if you allocate one single core, out of your, I don't know, 12 or 20 cores on your server, on, on your servers, and allocate uh, one SSD or more from each server or from a small subset of these servers, we would create a distributed file system across these servers. Um, high performance, we'll show the numbers in a bit. Uh, imagine that you have 100 or 1,000 servers. Uh, you do not need any JBODs, you do not need any fiber sh channel switches, any SAN or file array. Uh, all you need to do is you need to give us a core and an SSD or more in your uh, architecture, in your current existing ser servers, and we will run alongside your application on these servers, right? We do not take over the server. We do not convert it into a Weka environment. It's uh, side by side with your applications. Um, so you basically, you get this high performance file system uh, r running on your servers. Um, now, um, for example, you can ask about capacity. We're able to tier to an on-prem or to an off-prem cloud. Uh, so if you have your own S3 or Swift implementation, or you were using S3 or uh, Google Cloud, uh, we would tier that data to that. So for your application, when you think about it, your application would see a local file system that is actually benefiting from uh, 
SSD performance while the capacity is cloud capacity, okay? Um, and of course, data is always available to the compute application and they're agnostic to the fact that it spans over to the cloud. It's really transparent to them. We're doing it behind the scenes. So um, the neat thing about Weka is that we scale linearly. Um, the more compute you add, the more SSDs you add, the more performance we give you. And we actually just did, I think we, we didn't have a chance to put it in this presentation. We just, just did a test on uh, Amazon AWS where we ran uh, 246 instances. And you can see that uh, performance scaled and latency uh, just was flatlined, okay? Um, performance scale lin linearly, work on network stack. Uh, we wrote, I think that's important uh, a bit uh, to, to emphasize, we wrote our own network, st network stack. We're using SRIOV and DPDK uh, to provide low latency. Really, we did a lot of work uh, on giving you the best performance that your CPU cycles can actually provide you. Uh, one more thing about it is that uh, if we take a look at some numbers over and that side, so a single core, a single CPU core running Weka connected to an SSD would give you approximately 30K ops, and, a, a, and that would be sub 500 millisecond latency. Actually, in AWS, we've seen that it's, it was uh, 400 microseconds. Uh, and that same, uh, again, depending on the IO pattern that you're running, and that same core would give you approximately 300 megabyte per second throughput. So um, 100 servers, would give you approximately uh, 40 gigabyte per second and approximately 2.5 uh, 2 million ops. Uh, you want to increase that, make it a thousand servers, it would scale linearly with these numbers. Uh, and of course, one thing, uh, we're doing that over your standard ethernet. As I mentioned, we don't need any fiber channel, we don't need any InfiniBand. We're doing it over your standard ethernet because currently you already have your compute environment connected to a 10 gig or to a 40 gig or more even. So um, the Facebook disaggregate lab testing, which was awesome and thank you for inviting us by the way. It was a pleasure working together. Uh, as I said, we only had like uh, two or three days uh, to do it because we were even uh, past the submission date. Um, basically what we took is we took 10 Leopard servers. We allocated 10 Leopard servers. Um, we configured them with two M.2 NVMEs that were um, connected to the servers. We installed our software. We actually, I do want to say that we did hit an issue uh, that we learned from. Uh, apparently, and that's interesting. Apparently, the NVMEs are uh, formatted for 4K and not the regular 512. So that, that's, that's interesting. We learned from that. Um, we adapted, and then we came and installed uh, our version literally installed within minutes, okay? Um, we are still using like a YAM repository in RPM and we rely on our clients to actually automate that however they, they need to. Uh, so within minutes, uh, the system was up and running. Um, we ran, the, the numbers I'm gonna show you are actually from a, a general, um, you, you all know this benchmark, I, I believe. Um, so uh, numbers. Uh, on that specific, and by the way, it's important to understand that the numbers I'm showing are for that specific environment, uh, which when you think about it, uh, relies on your uh, network infrastructure and on your CPU and your uh, storage performance, on your uh, M.2 performance. Uh, having said that, uh, faster CPUs would boost performance a bit, faster storage would boost performance a bit more. So uh, 4K read ops, we got approximately 601 uh, K, that's I think a decent number for 10 servers. Um, one megabyte uh, reads, for example, we got uh, 5.6 uh, gigabyte per second on these 10 servers. Again, uh, no red controller, no fiber channel, no, no JBODs, no nothing. It's all on your servers. Uh, one megabyte writes, we got uh, 943 uh, per server. And the way we like to calculate wake up performance actually is by how much a server can give you, because each of your servers is a bit different. So how much each of your server can give you, and then uh, when you do the sizing, you can actually think uh, how many servers you would need to meet your performance requirements. 
Um, in this uh, specific environment, we didn't have any object store connected. I imagine if we had another day, maybe we could have done that also. Um, but we did uh, test the system. We did, uh, did do some hard drive test, failure testing, node failure testing. Uh, we did connect it to our uh, support cloud and verified connectivity. Basically, it ran as it should, um, getting decent numbers. And again, uh, in the disaggregate lab, you can take a look at also at the latencies. Um, so taking the numbers that we got from the disaggregate lab, we did some projection on the, how much you would get from uh, um, like a bigger cluster. Okay, I think these are um, impressive numbers, uh, but it all depends on your con environment. Um, I think one, one important thing to do, to say, is that um, we, we were installed on 10 servers, which is like a nice uh, starting point with decent performance, right? Um, you do not have to do all of the sizing on day one, and you do not have to pay for all of your hardware and servers on day one. Uh, you can install on 10 servers, then maybe you meet your performance demands, uh, and then maybe on day two, you install, you, you expand that Weka cluster to 100 servers, right? To meet your demands and your capacity. If you want to just to allow Weka more performance, you just need to allocate more cores, maybe on these servers, maybe on other servers. If you want to give Weka more capacity, you just need to allow us to use more SSDs. Again, maybe on these servers, maybe on other servers. Uh, one more thing here is that um, you don't necessarily even have to have Weka running on all of the compute environment in order to consume Weka. So, because we do also have clients that are uh, connecting to the Weka cluster without running Weka. So, awesome, more than enough. Um, so, essentially, uh, what we learned from the OCP environment, from the disaggregate lab, we just ran it, it worked, we learned about the 4K thing, which was awesome. Uh, we're OCP ready. We do, have, we do see some room for improvement in what we did, but that's, I think, like uh, improving the good. Um, thank you, questions? Yes. Awesome question, I'll repeat it. So we're using, uh, the question is if we're using SRIV and DPDK, and DPDK, and do we need to do it on separate NICs? So the, w the reason we're using SRIOV is because we do not want you as a customer to pay for another NIC dedicated to Weka. So we use SRIOV to split your currently working NIC uh, to virtual functions, which we would take, uh, using DPDK, we would take one or two, or however you allocate to us to work. Uh, you do have to do it unless you want to give us a dedicated NIC. Um, it's a cost thing. Yes. Um, so, burst, so, so the answer is yes, we are working with HPC and National Labs. Burst buffer is actually, if you take a look at it, it's a mature architecture which was uh, solving um, performance problem on HDD-based environment and checkpointing end-to-one and end-to-end -end checkpointing. When you use, actually, we, we show Weka as a replacement for burst buffers, because once you have that, you already have your uh, file system that already has that uh, low latency and throughput that they need in order to meet, to replace burst, burst buffer. So um, it's certainly not a cache. It's a, uh, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, it's not a cache. It can tier to an object store. We did have a customer peer seeing us and actually uh, is about to issue a purchase order for a 6.5 petabyte object store uh, behind us. So that's, I think, a decent. That's all right. Uh, so um, if you could go a couple of slides back to the picture of hardware. Yes, yeah, so this Ava card, fascinating piece of equipment that we used. We have a workshop uh, starting, I think, in room C. We're going to be covering it. It's, it's quite interesting um, if you want to deploy PCI Express Flash on your servers. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, this was great. And please reach out to us or to the partners uh, directly. 
to evaluate more stuff or to use the disaggregate lab. Thank you.